So this is lecture 11 of ECE 5312. So we're going to build upon lecture 10. What we're going to do is we're going to actually look at another example. QAM is um, in the sense that it's nice and orderly. Well, first of all, I want to let you know that not all QAM modulation looks like that. So it's a particular type. It's like rectangular or square QAM. It's like do, 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 But in reality, QAM is anything that involves a combination of phase and amplitude modulation, right? Otherwise, um, like, you know, the rectangular pattern should not be assumed to hold all schemes, but that particular type. But now what I want is I want to sort of delve into a more complicated modulation scheme, which is MPFK, okay, MRE phase shift keying. And let's do the same thing as before. Let's vectorize this guy, right? So how do we vectorize him? Well, again, I think we had a winning combination before with respect to the choice of basis we had. So we have phi 1 of t is equal to the square root of 2 over t cos omega ct. And phi 2 of t is equal to the square root of t over 2 over t sine omega ct. Now, the trick, OK? So you might say, OK, what, what is this the general layout of a PSK modulation? So let's, let's bring that up here. So a PSK modulation. So if I had SI of t, what is it equal to? So first of all, constant amplitude. We have cosine omega ct. And then what we have is 2 pi i divided by m. So that is m psk in waveform domain. Okay. And what you can see are things such as this guy here. So we're making the assumption that all phase representations are all evenly spaced out across all 2 pi, right? So what we do is it's almost like a pizza. And we have sort of going from one phase representation to the next. Like so, so 1 si to the next. So si, si plus 1, si plus 2, they're all separated by 2 pi divided by m phase. So remember what we talked about. This type of representation is a little tricky. If m is too large, your phase difference becomes rather small. And if your hardware is not up to the ch challenge of coping with very small phase differences, you're not using symbols. It's like, is that SI or SI plus 1? Uh, and then disaster happens. Your bit errors occur. So the, the problem is how to decompose. SI of t into phi 1 of t and phi 2 of t. Okay. I want to write verboten, but I, I think I'm going to misspell it. <laughs> Just kidding. That's German. So what happens is we know let's adopt the same sort of basis function as before, because it worked pretty well, right? We had two orthogonal waveforms, sine and cosine. We normalized them, so that's cool. So now the key is, how do we, like, it's not quite obvious, but how do we take this guy and try and decompose him into these possible types of sines and cosines. So it's not, it's not super duper obvious, right? So again, sadly, we're going to have to use trig identities. Ah, trig identities. So what we need to do is, OK, so we take this SI business. And the first thing I want to do is, OK, um, if, we, if we can somehow re rewrite all of this into, first of all, we have a cos. We take this uh, cos omega ct plus theta i, okay, and theta i is 2 pi i over m. And what we do is we say, let's play a trick here. Cos a plus b, 
Mm. So let's say we take the quiz we just done, right? So cos A plus B. All righty. What happens is if you do cos A plus B, it's going to be actually equal to, as you see here, it's going to be equal to cos B times cos A minus sine B times sine A. And so that's actually quite nice because now, ah, I see my omega CT in cosine and in sine. And if you notice, I've also played around with these guys here. I, again, just like what Jerry Seinfeld would say if he was an electrical engineer, I've done nothing. What, what I've essentially done is I've added something and I've added the inverse of something together and then I'm going to carve out one part of that and make it my basis function. So well, let's, let's go back to this. this. This is really cool stuff. Just because I think color code works so much better. So what happens is I take my sine i of t and I take my a cosine omega ct plus theta i. So let's say we do that, okay? And so we know that this looks eerily similar to, uh, this looks like cos a plus b. And that is going to be, in turn, by trig identity, that's going to be equal to cos a cos b minus sine a sine b. Now, um, so, so if we do that sort of thing, we now have si is equal to a cos omega c t cos fa, a theta i and then minus a sine omega c t sine theta i. Now, we're getting there. But the only problem is I don't see exactly phi 1 and phi 2 here because I don't have the one square root of 2 over t. So what we do, just like Seinfeld would do, you do nothing. Right? So I've not created and I've not destroyed anything. Exactly equivalent. Now, oh, you know what I want to do. What happens is I say, okay, brrr, with sound effects. Um, I take that and I take this guy and I say, ah, this is my phi 1 of t. That is my phi 2 of t. I know these guys are orthonormal with each other. Very good. So now what I do is I say, okay, a cos theta i phi 1 of t minus a sine theta i, and then of course I forgot this thing. See, I'm so bad. So then what happens is, so this here would go into a vector, and this guy here would also go into a vector. So, so in reality, in reality, what this would be equal to is si the vector will be equal to, I wish I was thinking, it's not midnight. <laughs> right, it's minus. So this guy is actually pretty cool. So what happens is, so what, what do we notice? The amplitude is the same. And what we're doing is we're actually creating, we're sweeping out a circle as a function of theta i. So for every angle, we basically get a point on this imaginary circle with radius a. And, well, a square root t over 2, right? Beautiful. Now, given this waveform representation, we can actually proceed to do the same calculations we did before with QPSK. 
So what happens is now we have this decomposition, and we can actually take this one step further. We know, oh, we know that the energy of this signal is going to be equal to a squared t over 2. <gasps> it looks like, folks, that, that that stuff that I wrote before, so let's, we, we go back to the screen. It looks like, oh my god, look at this, and that. That looks like the square root of a squared t over 2. And that's a squared t over 2 as well. Oh my god. And what that means is we know that for a phase modulation, this is the energy. It's the same distance from the origin to those points, which is fixed around that circle. So a way we can do a shorthand is, let's not call it this, it's the square root of the energy i, which is the same for all i. Right? So, given that, we have this sort of representation thing going. So now we have the signal representation of square root of e. Doesn't matter which i, it's all the same. And only thing that varies is the x and the y, like, you know, the phi 1 and it's a cosine and a minus sign, and this will chart out a circle around the origin. Cool? So we took something, so before QAM, everybody could see sort of the grid pattern, right? But PSK modulation is a little tricky. It has all this like angular displacement. I've just now transformed your world. Now what we have essentially is just a simple sine and a simple cosine. So even if, let's say, you do a quiz and stuff, and you leave the answer in this, that's cool. I know what I'll take out MATLAB or my calculator, and that will be it, right? How many people here use MATLAB for simple things like this? How many people use MATLAB to calculate your taxes? <laughs> yeah, I would pay good money for a toolbox that does that. So, so unfortunately, this year's a little bit more complicated. <laughs> so, D-min is a little bit trickier, right? Because now we don't, now what we want to do is we want to do vector subtraction. We want to do vector subtraction from S0 to S1. So it's two points on that circle, and we now need to subtract off. But if we vectorize everything, this is straightforward, n'est-ce pas? So what ends up happening is we take SI, so S0 and S1, we plug in the value. So it's nice. We deal with S0. So it's theta i is equal to 0. What's cos of 0? What's cos of, what's sine of 0? Right? Beautiful. And now all we have to worry about is this other oddball term. What's cos of 2 pi over m? Well, that's, that's a little bit more complicated to solve. But it doesn't matter. The subtraction of those two, take the norm squared, and what you're going to get at the end of the day, this is familiar. This kind of looks like what you did for your quiz, but for the ternary modulation, right? So as an exercise for the student, EF, you should try and solve for this and make sure that, in fact, it is true. Okay? So just double check the, the correlation coefficient. Take the dot product of those two vectors to see that, in fact, it's equal to the difference in their angle, right? Now, let's, let's, let's do a little summary. So I already did this in the last lecture, but it's, it's worth going over this again. So this, if anything, if you want to, I'm not sure how many people here are printing out these things or putting post-it notes and, and stuff and putting stars and, and, ja and all that jazz. But if you do keep, if you want a reference in very badly written handwriting, then lex this slide, slide 3 of 8, is your slide. <laughs> because what happens is this is side by side. Waveforms on the left, vectors on the right. And so, uh, like in the last several lectures, we saw over and over and over again how to calculate the power efficiency using waveforms, right? And it got kind of messy in all those integrals. It almost feels like calculus 2, 3, 4, whichever one. Vectors we have some similar steps. One, find an orthonormal basis function. So far, we've kept things uber simple. Sine and cosine, right? Two-dimensional sinusoids, wonderful. 
And then the math is all just vector dot products with each other and summations and norms and norm squared. And you get the same thing. Now, the one thing I didn't talk about is suppose we want to create a brand new set of basis functions. So how do you create these orthonormal basis functions? And that's where Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization comes in. Because sometimes we can choose the obvious, sometimes we don't. All right. Before we jump into orthonormal basis function creation and stuff, before this is sort of like another one of my favorites. This comes up in probability. It also comes up in this course, too. And elsewhere, Schwartz's inequality. So when I say Schwartz's inequality, what, 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 what are you thinking? I see a lot of faces, and everyone's like, hmm. Well, whenever I think of Schwartz's inequality, or just Schwartz's, when I hear Schwartz's, I forget inequality, there's a really, 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 really good smoked meat place in Montreal called Schwartz's. So if any of you love smoked meat, this is like the best place. There's like a lineup every day that goes, goes into that place. It's on St. Laurent Boulevard. So if any of you ever go to Montreal, I'll give you the directions. But after, like, you know, after I forget about my stomach a little bit, it's like, Schwartz's inequality. What's so powerful about Schwartz's inequality? What happens is engineers, right? The mantra that I always come up with when I talk about uh, engineers is we do for 10 cents what, what everybody else does for a dollar. And so in this case, um, Schwartz is inequality. In case you don't need an actual closed form solution, we can make an approximation. So suppose you have some sort of integral expression, and it's really, really hard to do, like two waveforms, and then it's the integral of that squared. Find a closed form expression. Do we really need that? Or can we just do it on a piecemeal individual basis? And the answer is, like, yeah, we can just forget about it. OK, so what we do is, there's this thing called Schwartz's inequality, and, and the expression's up here. Every community has a different Schwartz's inequality. Like, it comes up in many different versions and stuff. For this course, for this part of the course, for waveforms, this is Schwartz's inequality. And there's a, there's a proof that goes, that, you know, that goes through and derives all this. But I really want to emphasize, if you are bored and you want to fall asleep tonight, you can go through the proof. And, and the key is, what's very interesting about Schwartz's inequality in this context, okay, is separating two vectors, this guy here, what is the angle of separation between x and x2? And I think I'm running out of battery. So I think, uh, just hold on a second. Yeah, there, when there, there's a red light, it's like, uh-oh, bad news. OK, so let's see. So pardon me for a second. OK, we're golden. So you know, th th this thing burns through batteries like no tomorrow. So OK. So what ends up happening is Schwartz's inequality, in the case of this conversion between waveform domain and the vector domain, is very important. Because look at PSK modulation. We didn't have right angles between two points. We had this very nasty situation of we had these two arbitrary points in space they're separated by angle. What is it equal to? And the answer is you use Schwartz's inequality in order to solve for it. So we know that in this case, you know, law of cosines or whatnot, we can say, OK, I have the length of S1, the length of S2. And so what would, uh, what would theta be in between the two, especially if we project S2 onto S1? So we use all these linear algebra tricks. And what happens is if we use Schwartz's inequality, 
What it comes down to is we can actually rewrite everything using this sort of cosine representation. We end up getting something like this. So the proof essentially comes down to um, a little bit of like looking at the linear algebra behind it. So what happens is if I take the dot product of one times the dot product of another. So look at this expression up here. The co oh, well, why am I pointing up on the screen? So we know that this holds true, right? Does everyone see where we got this from? Right? So we have S1 dot S2. So that's a dot product. So that's this guy here. And then we have the norm of S1 and the norm of S2 multiply with each other. That's the norm of S1. That's the norm of S2. And there's a cosine, theta. Now, what happens is we know. So where do we get the inequality from? Cosine can be less than or equal to 1, the magnitude of it. So if we remove the cosine theta to simplify our life, the la largest, the, the biggest that this left-hand side can be equal to, uh, sorry, the largest that this guy can be equal to this guy here. That's equality. And that's when we get sine of theta is equal to 1. Otherwise, this guy will be guaranteed to be smaller. Oh, uh, sorry, no, not smaller. Larger relative to the right-hand side, right? So that's how we prove Schwartz's inequality. Hmm, I'm feeling hungry. Smoked meat. Actually, quick question. How many people here like smoked meat? Smoke me. Ah, I'm just thinking about dinner right now. Uh, tofu version of it. So, <laughs> so what we're going to do at the last part of this lecture is we're going to look at Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization procedure. Unfortunately, this does not remind me of food. Okay, uh, <laughs> that's so bad. But what happens is Gram-Schmidt is really important. I'm going to. I'm just going to go all out and draw what I'm going to do over here. OK, so let's go to the computer. So Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. So G, S, orthogonalization procedure. So this is both easy and very, very hard. Hard in the sense that you can get lost very quickly in this sort of tedious little mathematics that you have to do every step of the way. So what Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization does is, suppose I have waveform S1, S2, S3, S4. Make me an orthonormal basis. Ah, OK. So for instance, so if I have S1 of t, S2 of t, S3 of t, S4 of t. I can have like a gajillion of these guys. And I say, OK, from this, please make me an orthonormal basis function, or functions. So what, or, what Gram-Schmidt does is basically adds a frame of reference in the space contained by those four waveforms. So what's the first thing you do? And this is actually a good sci-fi question. I'm not sure how many people here like sci-fi. But for instance, the first thing you want to know is who's going to be serving as the pr primary frame of reference. So what we're trying to do here is we're going to bootstrap a frame of reference. And so what do I mean by that? So for instance, if you're in space, and I'll come up to that point about science fiction in a few minutes. If you're in space, what's up? What's down? What's, you know, and it, it depends. And so here's the point. Have you ever wondered in Star Trek, whenever the Starship Enterprise meets the Romulans or the Klingons or some space race, everyone's orientated in the right direction? Everyone's facing up. It's like, oh, Here's the bird of prey, do, 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 do. and the enterprise is facing it. Everyone's facing up. You never have this odd situation of, oh, they look kind of sideways to me, right? Everyone's sort of looking eye to eye, and it's like, that's true. Is it? And like, you know, you might say, well, what about, it's the spin of the galaxy. Yeah, that's it. The, the galaxy is dictating what is up, right? There's like the axis and stuff. But wait a minute, 
this galaxy is pointed in this way, and then the other galaxy. So let's say someone from another galaxy travels through space and comes to our galaxy and is like, hey, everyone's kind of crooked here and stuff, right? So have you, no, no one's ever wondered that, right? As in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, what Mr. Spock said to Captain Kirk when they were the Mutara Nebula fighting Khan is, I think his weakness is he's two-dimensional thinking. So what did they do? They go up and they add the third dimension, and that's how the Enterprise won the day. So if any of you have time, as homework, watch Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. No, just kidding. Good film, though. So actually, you know, um, um, William Shatner is actually an alumni from, from McGill, which was where I did my undergrad and my PhD from. And what the students did, normally when you have a building named after you, you're usually a generous benefactor of the university. At McGill, they actually decided, he's so famous, let's just name the student union after him. So it's now called the Shatner Building. Even though he didn't give us, but, but, you know, but he's one of our most famous alumni. Forget like some scientists and stuff, it's like he brought us Captain Kirk, right? So anyways, so what we want to do is we want to bootstrap this frame of reference. And so how does that mean? So here is S1 of t in space. S2 of t. Let's say S3 of t is like that. And then S4 of t is like that. So really, I have like these vectors, and they might be coming out of the page. They might come out like this. They might be in a fourth dimension that we have difficulty visualizing, right? Just like ants. Ants operate in two dimensions, right? And then all of a sudden, oh, where did a hand come from? And we pick something out, right? They don't see in like a, four, a third dimension. We probably don't think in a fourth dimension. So what ends up happening is notice the order in which I said, let's create a set of phi's. Phi 1 of t, phi 2 of t, phi 3 of t, and phi 4 of t. And say that we created, we bootstrap this frame of reference from in the order s1, s2, s3, s4. I must emphasize, it is very important we do it exactly in this order. You bootstrap in a different way, you get a totally different frame of reference. Hey. So, what we do, step one with Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, is choose one guy. So let's say we take S1 of t, right? So let's say it's this guy here. He is going to serve as phi 1 of t. Congratulations. But what's the problem with S1 of t? He ain't orthonormal. We have to normalize him. So what we do is we say, OK, from him, we're going to do phi 1 of t is equal to S1 of t. Ah, I have to draw my ones better. Square root of E S1. I basically normalize by the square root of the energy. And that will give me phi 1. Hey! So this guy here, that might be S1 of t. Where's that color? Boop. That is now phi 1 of t. So that's step one of Gram-Schmidt. So far, so good. Everyone get it? Yep. Okay. Yay! Phi, now, how do we create phi 2? So phi 2. Remember, it's orthogonal. So what we do is, let's say S2 is this. So what the first thing we need to do is we need to subtract out. So, so from this, we know we need to build on S2 of t. How do you do that? What we do, first of all, we take S2 of t. Oh, but S2 of t might contain some phi 1 of t. We've got to subtract it out. So what we do is we say, OK, I have this thing, g2 of t. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take s2 of t, and I'm going to subtract from s2 of t what I'm going to subtract. I'm going to subtract from him. I'm going to do the dot product. So I'm going to take, um, uh, what is it? s2, 1 phi 1 of t. And you might say, what, what, what is that, professor? I don't, I don't understand. OK, so what this guy is, that s2 
2, 1. That is equal to 0 to t, s2 of t, dotted with phi 1 of t dt. That is the amount of s2 of t contained in phi 1 of t. Then I multiply it by phi 1 of t, subtract it off of s2 of t. What is left is pure orthogonal magic, right? Then we take this guy and we say, okay, phi 2 of t is going to be equal to g2 of t divided by the energy of that, right? Oh, and I think there's a square root. So this guy now, now we have our, this guy, what we'll have is essentially, if we look at it, so that's, so this guy here is our first, and this will be our second, because we have a bunch of S2 of t that gets projected onto the phi 1 of t, and the remainder becomes phi 2 of t. And now what you do is you essentially wash, rinse, repeat. The next thing you do is you take S3 of t, you subtract off all the parts that, that are mapped into S, uh, phi 1 and phi 2 in the remainder. Same thing, S4, subtract off phi 3, I said by the square root of its energy, now give you phi 4. So several, several caveats, because there always has to be caveats, and I like using Latin. <laughs> so several caveats. Um, the first one is that if, let's say, you have four waveforms, you don't necessarily have four non-zero zero orthonormal basis functions. You might have something where it is totally captured by the existing orthonormal basis functions. So you might have, so if you have four waveforms, you might have four dimensions, you might have three dimensions, with one of the dimensions being zero, right? Two or one. The other thing, like I mentioned before, if we did S3, S1, S4, S2 as the ordering, <gasps> that is a migraine right there. And, and here's a trick. I encourage all of you, to do this, <laughs> but no, but seriously, oh, whatever that is. Boop. So let's say if you ever if you ever work at a job or your PhD advisor says do this or anything, and he's like, okay, Bengi, I want you to solve for find me phi one of t phi. T and also correct my math, Bengi. No, just kidding. I want you to find the following. And you might say, okay, let's do this thing. Okay? So first you say, okay, um, S3, okay. And then I normalize it by the energy of S3. Uh, okay, okay. And that's equal to phi 1 of t. Okay, check. Now, let's solve for phi 2 of t. Okay. So now what I do is I say uh, g2 of t uh, is equal to uh, s1 of t minus um, mm, uh, s1 uh, 1 uh, phi 1 of t. Okay, and, and, and what happens is the indices are going to become very confusing, right? And Bengi's going to be upset. So then what happens is I go to Ann, and then I say, Ann, this is what you do. Just relabel it. Professor Raglinski never says that you can't relabel anything according to what you think is convenient. So what happens is if you relabel it, one, two, three, four, confusion gone. I would say 90% of the time when you deal with Gramm-Schmidt orthogonalization, this is what gets people hung up the most. It's like the indices are like, oh, I'm losing track. And then in the end, it's like you get, you, you get very interesting modern art, you know, instead of instead of an actual basis function, all right? So, so if, if you look in the slide, so we're going to flip, 
But essentially, so, so slide seven basically summarizes step by step by step. But really, what I want to do is go to the last slide, slide eight. And what slide eight is, is the entire procedure summarized in bulleted form. Don't you wish life was like that? Like legal documents or you know, income taxes, it's all bullets, right? Instead, it's like legalese. This is fantastic because what happens is this tells you the procedure. What the GI is, is everything in that waveform that's not contained in all the preceding orthonormal basis representations. So it's the leftover part. And then you normalize that leftover in order to give you the new basis function, right? So this is how you bootstrap your own reference frame. So now, just a few notes. So if the dimension n is less than or equal to the given signals m, what happens is there's all that linear dependency, linear independent stuff, totally like linear algebra, right? So what happens is if we have the number of signals is equal to number of dimensions, we got linear independence because it's almost like you have full rank matrix. On the other hand, if not, you have some dependencies in there between the waveforms. So they're not totally independent of each other. There is some combination of some that make another. All right. So that, OK, um, is Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. And that's actually really powerful stuff because you're going to be using it, especially if you do anything that involves creating your own, um, uh, your own basis functions and, and the like. So like for, for like, let's say, like suppose you have um, some sort of modulation scheme that uses, let's say, six or ten different waveforms to represent various bit patterns. Um, and they may or may not contain sinusoids or no obvious patterns. And you want to make something nice and n-dimensional. Because what happens is if you have like an n-dimensional uh, frame of reference. So like, you know, most of the modulation schemes we deal with are two-dimensional. And we saw the benefits in power efficiency between two-dimensional modulation schemes and one-dimensional. What happens if we have even more dimensions? It becomes more p power efficient. Like, let's say three-dimensional. We have volumes rather than just areas and stuff. So we, we can compact, if you will. So like, how would a three-dimensional modulation scheme look like? This is how. No, let, let me first. No, seriously, a three-dimensional modulation scheme is actually pretty powerful because what you got is, remember, it's all about how close those signal constellation points are with each other. So if you have a three-dimensional modulation scheme, so you might have a point here, 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 maybe one here, 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 here. So what happens is you have a point there, you have a point on the other side of the axis, a point there, a point there, a point there, 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 there. So what you got is they're still, they're, they're all approximately the same distance. They're actually more packed together in that volume than if you had this wide surface. So remember like PAM modulation. What was bad about it? You had to spend a lot of energy to reach the farthest signal constellation points on that line. And fit nicely into this little grid of dots. Now, let's make a box of dots. Better yet, four-dimensional modulation. We'll make a hypercube of dots. Hypercube, I just love that. At least once a semester, I have to say the word hypercube. So there might be opportunities where, like, we're not going to dig too deeply into anything greater than two-dimensional modulation schemes, but there might be cases in life where you guys might have to, OK? So with that, um, that kind of wraps up uh, lecture um, 11, OK? OK. So yeah, so there's going to be a point in that video where it's going to be 